Bon dia, bonjour, uh, good morning. Thank you very much, first of all, for joining us this morning for this opening ceremony of the Barcelona Center for European Studies at the UPF. Dear Council of Luxembourg, here in Barcelona, dear Miss Vivian Reddy, Ferran, Professor Aregi, Professor Girau, Vice Rector of International Affairs of Internationalization, mm -hmm. Professor Isabel Valverde. Before I introduce the ceremony, let me apologize on behalf of the president of the university, Professor Jaume Casals, wanted to join us this morning, but due to an emergency meeting, he has been unable to, to be with us this morning, so I'm here to fill in his shoes as well as I can. Hopefully, he might be able to join us um, later this, this morning, but let me express, and I don't think I can overemphasize this enough, how happy I am as a vice rector and also as a professor in international relations to, to be part of this opening ceremony of the Barcelona Center for European Studies. We've been very lucky. I've promised that the rector will join us later today. He's here. So it's been much faster than I thought. <laughs> so today, I believe we have to congratulate us all. Um, it is indeed uh, an honor for the UPF uh, to receive such a, thing, a distinguished guest. Um, we may have abused a little bit of her because she was here yesterday as well. She honored us with her presence, not only today, but also um, yesterday. And the UPF, as surely all of you know already, it's 30 years old. In the past 30 years, like the European Union, the UPF has undergone some bumps along the road. There have been some uh, difficulties along the road, by, but like the European Union, it has survived quite successfully to these bumps along, along the road. And I think it goes without saying, but um, Europe has been at the very heart of the UPF from the very beginning. Due to the hard work of the International Relations Service, we've sent thousands of students throughout the Erasmus program. We've received, we've welcomed to this university a larger number of students from all the European universities. We've been part of at least five Erasmus Mundus programs in the past few years, and we've been honored to have three professors that have received uh, Jean Monet Cher, Professor Fernando Guirao, Professor um, Alejandro Saizarnaiz, and Professor Javier. Aregi as well. So Europe is at the very heart of our university, not only because of these three examples that I just used, but also in our teaching, in our spirit, and in everything we do. Europe is a very integral part of, of the DNA of the University Pompeu Fabra. I promise that I would be brief because I have to fill in the shoes of the, of the president. So let me just finish by thanking once again uh, Ms. Vivian Redding for, for her presence. We will be lucky to hear from her in a few minutes. And let me also thank uh, Professors Girao and Professor Aregi for pushing this center, for pushing this initiative. Let me also thank uh, Vice Rector Isabel Valverde and the Unit of International Relations for all the hard job and all the hard work they've put into this as well. Um, you know it all. Um, it's impossible for a university to launch such an ambitious initiative without the support of faculty and administrative units. So I think we all have to be very proud and very thankful for all their, for all their work. And without further ado, let me just yield the floor to Professor Aregi that will much better than I do introduce you to the work of the Barcelona Center for European Studies, what they intend to do and where it comes from. But thank you very much again for, for being here and for joining us for such a, an important day. I haven't mentioned that, of course, this is a historical day, not only for the UPF, but also for the European um, Union. I'm sure we all have mixed feelings, uh, if not sad feelings today. But probably because of that, or precisely because of that, there's no better day than this to talk and to dream about the European Union. So thank you very much again for being here. And Professor Aregi, the floor is all yours. You. 
Uh, thanks, many thanks, Pablo, uh, for the presentation and introduction. I will be also very brief uh, uh, because uh, the main, our main guest, I think, is much more interesting uh, what, whatever I could say. But in any case, I really would like to, um, to explain a little bit uh, uh, what is the buses and what is the buses for and what I think is going to be the added value of buses, not just for the UPA, but also in, in Barcelona and Catalonia. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much for everyone for being here. Um, um, I think even if we have uh, these kind of mixed feelings, I think it's a good day for at least for European uh, Union studies at UPF today. I think it's historic, actually it's a historical day because uh, 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 I think European Union is a really important uh, actor, political actor in our lives. I think I have the perception we are not very aware of this oftentimes. So uh, actually, one of the main roles of, of this institute is actually uh, uh, to be able to think a little bit more about uh, the European Union, to think a little bit more about uh, what is happening in Europe. I think my perception is that uh, uh, average citizen, even average academic, uh, uh, is far away of what is going on in Europe, and I think this is a problem. So uh, actually, one of the main uh, uh, goals of this, of this uh, center is going to be to bring cl closer uh, uh, the European Union to people, to citizens, to scholars, to uh, uh, policy makers, and to civil society in general. Okay? This is one of the main goals we have, and we will see how, how well we could actually uh, do uh, uh, this job in the coming years. Okay? So, um, uh, in September 2019, uh, the European Commission recognized uh, uh, the UPF as a center of excellence for European studies. I think this is, uh, uh, is a, well, it's a consequence of the of work made in the, in the last years uh, uh, by some people at the UPF. I would like to mention particularly Fernando Guirao and other colleagues as well, okay? And this is uh, very important for us because um, uh, we are going to, uh, uh, well, to be able to, to make some uh, uh, activities with, fun, with some funding, also to create some kind of organization and infrastructure at UPF in order to, to uh, well, to give one step further into, into this direction, okay? I would like also to thank a little bit, uh, first to the rector uh, and, and, and all, all his team, because from the very beginning, uh, they were very supporting on this, on this uh, institute, and of course, this is very important for us. Of course, also the campus manager, uh, Madame uh, Oliva, who is also here. Uh, thank you for, for the support from the very beginning. Uh, has been also quite important for us. And of course, the international uh, relations team of the university, which has been always very supportive and very professional, uh, helping us with all these applications and other issues as well. Okay. Um, and of course, I mean, I cannot forget uh, Ferran Terradellas, the support from the European uh, Commission in Barcelona has been key to, to celebrate this, this uh, uh, today in this ceremony. Okay, so many thanks, Ferran, for the support from the very beginning uh, 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 to this project, okay. Um, yes, very briefly, I would like to say a few things. Uh, 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 the main goals of the of bus, buses basically are going into four different directions, okay. The first one is going to be basically to improve uh, 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 teaching uh, on European Union issues. And in order to do that, basically what we are going to do is to include uh, some kind of a, a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. Uh, I think the education in the 21st century is clearly is not narrow uh, uh, to narrow disciplines. It is much more uh, a wild perspective and we are actually offering, we are going to offer two new courses with this perspective, and this is very important for us, okay? Because uh, uh, particularly complex issues cannot be understood only through one discipline, okay? So if we can understand uh, climate change, for example, or whatever, we need, uh, of course, I mean, to understand uh, the economic consequence, but also the political consequence, the political processes which are taking place. Uh, uh, of course, law is important, an important uh, discipline as, as well, and history as well. Okay. So basically, the idea is to gradually to integrate uh, 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 different approaches uh, for important issues. And this is what we are going to introduce actually in some courses already, okay? We are going to create two new courses for this. Also, we are going to make uh, stronger, uh, what we have, uh, we already have is the annual lectures on European Union. This is uh, made on, on the basis, uh, on yearly basis, and we invite uh, policymakers and also 
uh, uh, academics, good academics basically to, to make a lecture. I think it's quite successful so far, so we are going to continue with this. That, that is the first line uh, we are going to, to work. Uh, the second line would be more uh, uh, related to research activities. Uh, the idea is basically to introduce uh, the design of buses is going to be uh, uh, more or less pretty much like a think tank. Uh, and the, the goal is basically to attract talent uh, uh, to buses from coming from students, but also from policy makers, also from researchers, other kind of scholars. And, and, and the idea is basically to create uh, this kind of intergenerational uh, community uh, who are working from different perspectives and dif different disciplines on, on, on European issues, okay? At the moment, we have only three people working there, but I'm pretty sure that in the coming months, uh, uh, this is uh, going to be grow, grow, growing in terms of uh, scholars coming from, we have already applications actually from some country, urban countries who want to come uh, to work with us, okay? So um, I think this is a good sign. And the idea is to make this, uh, 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 or to make this, this center uh, to, to grow uh, uh, in talent, this is very important for us, uh, to produce good uh, uh, scientific outputs uh, and social outputs as well uh, uh, in the coming months, coming years, okay? Um, also, we are working uh, to get some kind of scholarship for young uh, 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 students, young uh, undergraduate and postgraduate. We are, well, now we have some talks with some organizations and I think we have some chances, so we are working also in this direction. And this is, of course, pretty much related to, to the idea of bringing talent, okay? It is very hard to bring talent without resources. So we are working uh, pretty much also in this line. Um, the third line would be uh, also to be uh, useful uh, 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 and to contribute to what extent in, uh, um, I would say, uh, uh, media, in the media, in the, in the media, because not, not only in the media, also in, in more social terms, because I think the contribution uh, uh, of uh, academics on European Union to the media, I think, is pretty poor uh, in terms of uh, uh, the inputs uh, uh, we could find in most of the times in the media. I think that the European Union is not well understood in, in, on average. Well, we have plenty of uh, information and, and surveys that actually claim that uh, basically uh, citizens know nothing about the European Union, which is also, uh, 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 I think, is pretty bad, bad news. And we have a responsibility and we, we, we are trying to, uh, well, basically to, um, to make um, uh, one seminar per term, open seminar for uh, everyone, not just not only for students, but also for civil society actors or any, anyone who is interested in, in, in uh, knowing what is going on in Europe. Uh, uh, Europe is a machine of making decisions, it's continuously making decisions, and I think it's important to let uh, know people what is going on in Europe, okay? Because uh, um, otherwise, uh, things, uh, uh, or, decisions which are made in Europe sometimes are not the best precisely because of that, okay? Um, also, we have, uh, 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 we are going to introduce this kind of buses, uh, uh, working paper series. We want to uh, allow uh, uh, and to show uh, what we are doing. And I, I think dissemination of our research and, and also the research and, and important topics for, uh, uh, in social terms, I think it's important that we have some kind of a, a, a uh, visibility, okay, so this is what we are going to do as well. And uh, there is uh, the last line of our um, working for the, uh, for the coming years is going to be more related to uh, uh, meetings between policy makers and also uh, experts, uh, uh, academic experts, okay. This is something which is uh, made oftentimes in, in British universities. I don't think it is very useful, very, very common in, 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 um, in local universities. And it's a pity because I think uh, both we can learn uh, quite a lot from each other, okay? So the idea, uh, I, I know quite well the Urban Center uh, of, a, of a University College London because I have a good colleague working there and sometimes I go there. And they make these meetings uh, regularly and I think it's a brilliant idea uh, because actually I think politicians who are able uh, and, and willing to learn from academics, they can learn a lot, okay? And they can. At the end of the day, they can see uh, uh, the inputs and the outputs uh, 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 of these discussions uh, in some kind of uh, policies they make, okay? So this is something uh, we, we are planning to do in, in the coming years, okay? And, uh, well, to conclude, because I don't want to, uh, uh, I wanted to be brief, uh, uh, so thank you everyone to, uh, to be here. Um, 
many other people who are not here because well, we couldn't invite to everyone. Everything has been very fast. I hope that they are willing to cooperate with us because this is a collective project, okay? This is clear. And the more people who want to join us, the best, okay? That, that, is, that is for sure. And of course, I would like to, to thank also to uh, uh, Madame uh, Redding uh, for coming to uh, open ceremony of this center because uh, I think she's uh, uh, one of the few persons in the European history that has introduced so many nice uh, hallmarks, I would say, in, in terms of policy that we are actually enjoying this because I'm also the coordinator of, uh, of Erasmus Mundum program uh, here in Barcelona and she introduced the Erasmus Mundum program uh, when she was a commissioner, okay? And many other uh, 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 issues that maybe Pablo now is going to, to, uh, to explain with more detail, but many thanks, uh, Madame Bo uh, um, Redding, for coming here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Javier. Now we are, we're going to move to the to the central moment of this opening ceremony, which is the speech that uh, Ms. Redding is going to share with us. That is going to deal with a Europe fit for the next decade. But before I yield the the floor to her, let me say a few words about about how happy we are um, for her presence today. I asked for a let me share with you an anecdote. I asked for a summary version of her CV, and the first summary they gave me was 12 pages long <laughs> for the introduction. So I said, could you please give me a shorter version? And the shorter version was three pages, three very long pages. So um, I thought that instead of explaining everything Ms. Redding has done, because I would do a very poor job. There's no way I can fit in five minutes all her her achievements, you all know she's been a very prominent uh, politician in Luxembourg, but also in the European <coughs> Union, both at the European Parliament for several years, and then later on in the European Commission, where she's held um, different areas, and also she's been the Vice President uh, to, the European, to the European Commission. So she's basically held uh, a large range of very significant roles in the, in the European Union. But what I would like to emphasize, and hopefully I won't do a misrepresentation of her long experience, I want to focus on five hallmarks, like Javier was saying, that I believe show both her very significant contribution to the construction of the European Union as a collective project, but also her commitment to improving the rights and the situation of European citizens. Um, and I think that's particularly remarkable. Her contribution has not only been to the collective construction of structures and institutions and general laws, but also to the specific rights and improving the situation of individuals um, across the European Union. One has been mentioned by, by Javier, which is her significant role in improving the Erasmus program. She was behind the expansion of the Erasmus program and she promoted the Erasmus Mundus. As I mentioned before, the UPF is honored to host uh, five Mundus programs. So this is something that not only as European citizens but also as an institution we're very thankful for. Uh, this has significantly made a change. Um, for us, as you know, the Erasmus Mundus program has not only allowed for, uni for European universities to enhance their cooperation, but has, has also favored the attraction of non-European students to Europe and also the mobility of European students across Europe. The second hallmark I want to emphasize, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it because every time we go to the cinemas here in, in Barcelona, we see at the beginning of every movie, which is the promotion of the um, EU media program uh, that has, again, uh, strengthen European cultures and culture in Europe. And I think that's crucial, again, not only as European citizens, but also as a university. Culture is an integral part, or should be an integral part, of what we do as universities. It's part of our public um, contribution. Third, and this I'm particularly speaking to the younger crowd, to our students, she's behind um, the promotion of the 
European tariffs of roaming, and I'm sure you'll be very, very thankful about that. Uh, this is something that we've seen more recently, but has been, I, I believe, one of the um, aspects that she's devoted a significant time to, and I'm sure that that was not an easy victory, but one that we all celebrate, and we're also, again, very thankful for that. And the fourth element I want to, to highlight, and here I want to, to stop a bit, is not only that she has contributed to improving the situation of European citizens, but particularly the situation of European women. And that, I cannot even imagine how hard it has been for the past 40 years, in, and forgive me for being politically incorrect, in a European Union that has not been extremely, extremely open to the active contribution of women, like every other state or institution. Here I'm not uh, pointing at the European Union alone. It must have been difficult for the past four years. Um, she uh, launched the um, um, legal proposal on women on boards, which was passed by the European Parliament, and it bears special recognition because it was adopted with the support of all European parties within the Parliament, which is, again, not an easy task, but a very difficult one, so I think we have to thank her also for her contribution to, to the equality of, of citizens in Europe. And finally, just to choose one more, because again, the list is very, 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 uh, very long. She played a key role in improving the rights of individuals, the rights of European citizens regarding consumption and also digital rights, as well as criminal uh, procedural law, which might seem something a little bit more distant to us, but for those of us who do research on the European construction, these sometimes not so visible um, hallmarks are essential for a strong construction of the European Union. So I think we have to be very thankful. I cannot overemphasize how honored we are and how happy, are, how happy we are for having Ms. Redding here with us. So I, I'm not going to uh, punish you with, um, with my words, so I'm going to uh, yield the floor to her. And again, she's going to talk to us about a very fitting topic, a Europe fit for the next decade and hopefully for the next few decades. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Redding. There are very many more, and thanks you mo most of all for inviting me to the opening ceremony. It has always been at uh, the forefront of my political action, uh, not to do things for now, but to have an input into things for tomorrow. And uh, Erasmus is one of those elements how to expand it so that the next generation can strive, how to give rights to people so that the next generation can go ahead. Well, thinking about Erasmus, um, okay, Erasmus Mundus and, 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 but then there are international couples who get married and who make one million Erasmus babies. And, uh, well, as life goes, uh, they are divorced or somebody, uh, somebody dies and there are succession questions, very complicated huh, for international couples. So when I became commissioner for justice, I uh, was the first one to make uh, a transnational family law, uh, thinking about the future of the Erasmus babies, you see, <laughs> not only of the Erasmus students. And I think it is very important as, as a political leader, you not only think about today and my election campaign tomorrow, but you think about the future. What do I leave so that the next generation can take independent, sovereign decisions in a sovereign uh, European Union? But let me start from the beginning. There are years where not so much happens, and then there are days in which history is made. 
One of these days was the 25th of March, 57, where the basis was laid for the building up of what we know today, our European Union, a project in modern history which is sui generis, had never been done before, uh, no other model worldwide, bring together independent nations which voluntarily agree on sharing sovereignty in order to become stronger uh, together. It was done at that moment, of course, in the um, remembrance, very fresh, uh, about the horrors of the world wars. And um, maybe the founding fathers took serious what Victor Hugo had said once, bullets are replaced by votes and battlefields by European brotherhood. Victor Hugo, long time before we created the European Union. You see there are people who have dreams and sometimes it needs some time a dream to become uh, reality. But let's look at the men who did this. Sorry there were no women at that time yet. Uh, things have changed dramatically. Good. <laughs> um, but let's look at the men who did this. Joseph Besch from Luxembourg, small country surrounded by borders. Konrad Adenauer from the Rhineland at the borders also. Henri Spack from Brussels, small country, borders. Alcide de Gasperi from Trentino, at the borders of Italy. Uh, Johann Wilhelm Bayem from Utrecht. Robert Schumann, born in Luxembourg and um, died as a French uh, uh, minister. So it was by people who had experienced in their life the border problem. How borders could become walls how borders could um, bring uh, wars about. And they decided no more borders, no more wars for the borders. And that was a historically important uh, step. Easy to say, but not so easy to do. If you look at history of mankind, and if you look at even what happens today, where some in our world are proud to build walls. We Europeans are proud to build bridges. And how, what was the methodology of the founding fathers? Not to say, okay, now we have the European Union and, um, no. They were very realistic politicians. They knew you couldn't impose it top down from one man moment to the other. You had to do it step by step. So they were advancing in a very realistic way, starting with a big problem at that moment. And the big problem was that uh, France and Germany started a new war. So at that time, in order to conduct a war, you needed steel and coal. That were the main elements. So they said, okay, let's take away steel and coal from uh, the uh, national uh, power and let's communitarize it so that they cannot, that we can control what they do with, with steel, steel and coal. And to make a long story short, after that the um, market was established, uh, the free mo movement of workers, workers, because not yet citizens, huh? they're very realistic. In this market, we needed workers to go from one place to another, so free movement of workers. And this developed step by step with a very strong moment coming with Maastricht, the Treaty of Maastricht, 1992, where the community of before became a union where afterwards the Schengen zone was built, where we created um, a common currency, unfortunately without a fiscal union, which uh, was a very big mistake, which we saw later on. The next big step was the Treaty of Lisbon, 1999, where we really went into making out of this continent a country-like 
system. With the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is not a constitution, but which has the same rights as a treaty, and which is considered by the European Court of Justice as a constitution, as our Bill of Rights, because in many judgments of the European Court of Justice, they uh, reflect on what is written in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So at that moment, citizenship, European citizenship, in the specificity of the double citizenship, I am Luxembourger and European, uh, you have a, even a triple citizenship. You are uh, Catalonia, you are Spain, and European. It's like the puppets, you know, those, uh, uh, those Russian puppets. One goes into the other, and it makes uh, an unity without making a um, division. So, citizenship, rule of law, and then uh, justice. Um, I have already said that um, we started with justice, but before Lisbon, justice was a complete national uh, competence. With Lisbon, justice became partly a European competence. And I started also, uh, because I had this in my hand, with a very down-to-earth uh, uh, problem-solving, circulation of documents. Uh, on justice. Who is going to, uh, to, to be the court if there is a rush to the court by different nationalities? Which, court has the which national court has the first priority? And then the family law uh, for uh, the Erasmus uh, couples um, in divorce and in uh, succession. You might think that it's not important. It is very important, uh, because if you have a Luxembourger uh, who marries, uh, um, uh, um, well, what can I, a, a German and lives in Spain, uh, can you understand what fight there will be between the three um, uh, countries on what law applies um, in the different systems. So there again, I did not eliminate Luxembourg uh, juridical law, I didn't eliminate the Spanish, and I didn't el eliminate um, the German, but I built bridges between the legislative system so that they can function uh, together. And I dreamt, I said, okay, we have um, the whole system of a state now. We have the parliament, we have uh, the senate, the council of ministers, and we have the European uh, Court of Justice, but we do not have a prosecutor. <laughs> prosecutor, that goes really to the national competence. And I said, well, I dream to have a prosecutor. The European prosecutor's office will open at the end of this year in Luxembourg. I made it. Uh, but also starting softly. It will not be responsible for everything. It will be in a first step responsible for the criminality against the European money, against the European budget. The step, second step will be cross-border crime uh, and uh, terrorism, which is per se, always um, uh, cross-border. So you see, you can have a dream, uh, but you must not put the whole thing in practice. You can put your dream by making the institution, but giving um, limited power to the institution, knowing that step by step by step, this power is going to be augmented. Now, where during all this time, Things didn't go smoothly always. We had a lot of crises uh, coming uh, up. Um, you still remember the financial crisis, which was an import from the banking crisis in the United States, which went on our banks, and then our national budgets had to pay um, for the banks, and then it became a, um, a, a crisis of the national budgets, and we didn't have the instruments to solve the problem. Because remember, I told you, um, when we created the euro, we didn't create a European um, economic minister and finance minister. So this was really, uh, this fiscal union was missing and we had to, f to find very quickly solutions in order um, to save the euro, to save the members of the euro. And whatever has been said and be written, Greece is not out of the euro. Greece is 
in the euro. It was painful, it was not easy, but we made it. The refugee crisis, which is not over, it will continue because um, from Africa we will have a lot of pushing from poor people, from people who are oppressed. So it will continue. We have not yet found the real solutions for this because the solidarity mechanism in the European Union doesn't function as it will, but we have managed already to bring the huge numbers down a little, but even this, uh, these numbers which are left over and which can grow at any moment again when there is a, um, a crisis, when there is a war, when whatever happens, well, there we have to work on it. And then, of course, uh, Brexit, everybody said we'll luck, um, Europe will break down. Did it break down? It didn't. On the contrary. We saw in the polls that um, because things were working, and when things working, people don't worry anymore. So do we need a European Union in the polls? The polls went down and down and down and down. And then came Brexit and Trump, and the polls went up and up and up and up. Everybody had understood, yes, yes, we need the European uh, Union because we cannot cope with that alone. Everybody had understood we cannot um, rely anymore on, on the security uh, um, cover uh, from the uh, United States. We have to build our own uh, security in Europe, and that is what's going to happen in the next uh, day. Um, my voice counts in the world because of the EU. In the last Eurobarometer, in average, 70% of uh, people uh, of the 500,000, yes, my, word, my voice counts because of the EU. In Spain, it's even higher, it's 76%. Uh, and then, what is important for the people? Free movement. 59% think that this is the most important. Well, this is all Europe is about. Peace, 55%. This is all Europe is about. That was in the head of our founding fathers. And you see, Euro, the Erasmus, and uh, all these kinds of things, 25%. So people say, it's nice to have. But what we need to have is a free movement and uh, the peace. Uh, now, if we ask them, uh, and that was the Bertelsmann Stiftung, which made it, the first was the Eurobarometer, uh, what do you expect of the new commission? First, environment. Second, economy. So people have really understood that this generation has to fix the environment problem if the next generation is supposed to have a normal life. When you ask the people, what is your personal concern? You as a citizen, rising living costs, 51%. Health problems, 28%. Job insecurity, 25%. And what do you think will be important for your children, for the next generation? EU uh, opinions, uh, poll, 54% deepening of the EU. Which shows what? That people have understood, in general. And that all the doomsday sayers, um, mostly in the media and on the social media, um, they are wrong. And that, yes, we can do it if we cling together. And I give you an example of one, I think, the, of the most emblematic um, legal texts which has been decided by the European Union in the last uh, coming in the, last, in the past years. Um, when I became Commissioner for Justice, that was just the moment when the Treaty of Lisbon and the Charter of Fundamental Rights entered into force. In this, there is a sentence which says, the personal data belongs to the person, not to a company and not to a, a government. It is written both in the treaty and in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And I saw that um, this right of the citizen was simply not applied 
because of a balkanization of legislations, very often contradicting themselves. So, in a nutshell, what I did, I eliminated 28 laws, I replaced them by one law for one continent, applying to all citizens and to all companies operating on this, um, uh, on this continent. Um, that was in January 2012, when I put the text on the table. I wouldn't have thought at that moment that this GDPR, these data protection rules, would so quickly become a world standard. They have become a world standard, where all over uh, the world um, countries, uh, states, apply similar rules or even copy what we have um, presented. So what does this show? This shows that if we have a clear idea which brings together rights of the individual and economic benefit, and if we make a strong uh, rule out of this altogether, Europeans, this rule has an importance worldwide. And why do I speak about this? Because we are on the edge now from passing to a new world, to a data economy. So this GDPR will be the basis for very important initiatives we will have to take in the next coming years on artificial intelligence, which is important for our health or the future of our health systems, of mobility, of self-driving cars, of our uh, new indus industrial uh, capacities. So we have already the standards. We have a chance to make the next standards if we do it under the same prerogatives and with the same System. But where are we coming from? In a nutshell, just to explain you where we are standing in the 21st century. Now, the beginning of the 21st century um, was a decade of Europe in communication, in technology. It was 2G, 3G, 4G, and um, the best standard worldwide, the GSM standard for telephony, and the Nokias of this world, the best telephones uh, which you could imagine. So that was uh, when person-to-person um, -person communication was important. And then we lost it to the Americans in the next decade. Um, the iPhone came out, and that was not only person-to-person um, uh, -person communication, it was linking a group of persons yeah? um, by a pocket computer. It became, together with the social media platforms, the um, decade of the American dominance. And today, we are at a new crossroad. Um, data economy is on the brink of, build, of building up, and that is linking objects to objects, linking information to information, and creating big information networks with a huge amount of data. Are we already out of the platform period? No, but it has changed. Because the platforms, the social media platforms, were created to do good to the human beings. Positive, nice. Now we have seen that they are doing bad to the European, to the human beings. They have become wicked and vulnerable in their reputation. Not only because they are monopolies. I give you one uh, number. Uh, the Google market force in the EU is 97%. Uh, not only because they have taken all the revenue of uh, uh, advertisement. You know that um, the platforms, the uh, social media platforms, in uh, 2019, they had an advertisement revenue of 200 billion euros. That is much more than all the newspapers, radios, televisions, and films together. They're really dominating. 
but vulnerable in reputation. Why? Because it, had gone to, it has gone to their head, and they have exaggerated. They developed their systems into perversity, intervening into elections by targeted advertisement, enhancing the vulnerable, uh, uh, influencing the vulnerable groups of people by psychological warfare, and by the amplification-based algorithms uh, using a vast amount of public available data and personal data which has simply illegally been bought or stolen. And this leads to voter suppression, disinformation, push-up negative news in the news feed. Now I give you two examples. First one was Brexit, the Brexit referendum. And what I tell you now is not a secret that has been sub judice, uh, there have been hearings in uh, the um, parliaments everywhere and uh, judges have clearly made it uh, that this was criminal. Now, Brexit referendum. SLC Group, together with Cambridge Analytica, Great Britain and US, organized by Bannon, the councillor of Trump, financed by the family Mercer, the big American financiers. They intervened with this uh, targeted advertising on the vulnerable groups of people in order to tell them all the fake news they needed to know in order to vote Brexit. Now it worked so well that Bannon took the experience of Cambridge Analytica and of the Brexit um, referendum experience and implemented it during the first Trump election. And do you know that in 2020, Facebook just has allowed political ads for the new US elections this year. So you see what's going on. This has many negative implications because it's not only the elections here which have been falsified. Um, Cambridge Analytica went bust in Great Britain because of all the, 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 the legal case, but it is working full in Central and South America and in uh, Africa, helping most of all uh, not so clean uh, leaders uh, to continue their work. It's working now, it's working in 68 countries. Okay. Do you know what is in the United States the profession which has the highest growth of income? Data brokers. Those who collect data, those who steal data, those who buy data, and then hand it over to Cambridge Analytica of this world. So we have a real problem here. And we have a real problem with the social media because they are giving millions of data to uh, those companies. Uh, so the trust in platforms is going down, but the need for data and the availability for data is going up. Today we utilize, we collectively, utilize only 97, no, only 3% uh, of the data available. 97% goes uh, is not utilized. And tomorrow, with the IoT, with the Internet of uh, Things, um, where objects are communicating which is other, uh, we are going to have an enormous amount of data. By 2025, there will be 500 billion connected devices, all of them producing data. And that is why the war, the global competition about data is at the core of the trade wars today. And the trade war on this subject has been launched by Trump, very clearly so, who likes to stop the Europeans to invest into 5G and to go for the applications which will be made possible by 5G 
This is uh, cars, mobility, uh, health, distant health, for instance, con connected, uh, um, uh, uh, connected hospitals, uh, self-driving car, the new um, manufacturing systems in, uh, the, in our industry. So behind all the security vibe, there are the questions, who is going to have this in its hands and who is going to be the data-driven society of tomorrow and who to whom belong those data. Now, we Europeans sit on a mine of non-personal data. The Commission has pledged to create a trusted pool of non-personal data to fuel European innovation for our companies. And the Commission has also said, well, there is enormous amount of European data on the social media platforms, which, and I quote uh, Thierry Breton, the Commissioner responsible for this, sometimes obtained in questionable circumstances, diplomatically saying sometimes stolen. This is worse 4% of European GDP. And that is why the Commission said very clear, we have to implement our rules and all those who utilize our data have to adapt to our rules and not the other way around. Very strict terms of compliance will be applied. Because, and I quote again Thierry Breton, uh, by 2025, the vast majority of data will not be created by humans, but by objects and machines, Internet of Things, and uh, industry. These objects will create nearly 90% of humanity's data. It is a huge potential source of growth for Europe, because we have the largest industrial market in the world, and it is linked to industry, with leading players, particularly in the 4.0 industry, who have already developed performing digital twins. Thierry Breton says, my objective is therefore clear, to make Europe a global data hub for data, both personal and industrial, benefiting to all European economic players, SME startup large group, and of course to the European citizens. And that brings me then uh, to, the to one of the major problems, how to analyze all this data which comes out. Um, today already we create 2.5 quintillion bytes per day. And I have explained to you what we create tomorrow. So the human brain is not capable anymore to analyze this, we need machines to analyze it, uh, to gather, to select, and to analyze it. These machines are programmed by algorithms, and the algorithms are created by human beings. So all the nonsense of artificial intelligence, forget it. There is no artificial intelligence. Intelligence is human, and it cannot be copied. AI cannot replace human intelligence. A machine does not invent anything. It reproduces what it has been told to do. Responsibility of the universities to create the programmers, which are can we can to whom we can entrust to build artificial intelligence, which, well, I cannot change the name anymore. Uh, it is wrong artificial intelligence. It should be called augmented intelligence because it will help us with our limited capacity uh, of our minds. It will help us to analyze an enormous amount of money, but uh, of data, of money, yes, <laughs> and uh, um, an enormous amount of data, and it will be our responsibility as professionals, as doctors, as politicians, as lawyers, as judges, to take our own 
decisions. It will not be the machine, but it will be the human beings. Now, in order this to happen, we have to regulate. And here we have a problem. I don't know how to solve it. Because the speed of technology is rushing in front. The speed of politics hmm, is rather slow. Um, <laughs> so the problem is the pace of regulation is not the pace of innovation. And that might create in the mind of the people distrust because the politicians are not capable to help them and trust is key if we want to, no we don't have a choice, we will build this uh, data economy or it will build us. Th that's the alternative. Do we build it or does it build us? Are we standard makers or standard takers? So big data require big rights, artificial intelligence requires policy intelligence. Competition should be by the rules and not for the rules. It should focus on activities and not on entities. We have managed to do it with GDPR. We should be capable to do it also with AI. And we are working on it. The expert group uh, of the European Commission of, um, in AI has presented 23 recommendations in June 2019. We are going to focus on mandatory screening processes for high-risk AI. You do not need to regulate everything, but you need to regulate the high-risk AI. And Vice President Vestager has proposed to bar AI-enabled mass-scale scoring of individual face recognition and company. Hmm? Uh, uh, that can be a breaker of democracies completely if you put it into the wrong hands. Very, very dangerous indeed. So we don't want to kill innovation, but we want to build a trustworthy AI with high ethical standards. It was so interesting in Davos now that um, CEOs, also American ones, started to say, to warn the audiences about possible deviations of AI, and even the chief executive of uh, Alphabet and uh, Google, um, Sundar Peshai, said we must regulate artificial intelligence. Why they were saying that in Davos, the American government said, please don't regulate uh, the artificial intelligence. Well, we are going to regulate it. <laughs> Full stop. And you will hear in the very near future of Vestager and Breton uh, on this uh, subject. Um, Mr. Ferran Taradellas will inform you about this. Because we want to be standard makers and not standard uh, takers. We want to keep our sovereignty in technological terms. Speaking about sovereignty, what we did when Trump started to tear down the international agreements the first one he teared down was the TPP, the Trans Pacific um, partnership uh, which has been built between the United States and the Asian, Asian Rim, and also uh, the, um, the agreements with uh, Central and South America. What did we do? The moment he was doing that, we filled the void. because we want to be global standard makers, because we want to build a network of friends, because we will need to have relations with other parts of the world for the future generation, and because we know that in today's global value chain, trade wars are easy to lose. 
Um, even uh, in a continent, uh, no continent can operate today in self-sufficiency, and no manufacturer can. Um, how much Germany do you think is in a German car? <laughs> how much America is in the iPhone? Well, I tell you, for the iPhone, 90% of the iPhone is not American. And that is not a critic. That is only seeing how it works. Global value chains, if you interrupt them, that is very negative for your industry. And just to debunk a few myths, because nobody thinks about that. Do you know that the EU invests more in the United States than the United States invests in the EU? Do you know that the EU buys more US services than the US buys European services? And do you know that the EU employs more American workers than the Americans employ workers from Europe? Do we trust in ourselves? Do we want to utilize the force we have? We are the biggest trade power in the world. The biggest organized trade power in the world. We are that. One fourth of the worldwide exports comes from Europe. We are the biggest worldwide foreign investor. The euro is the second currency in the world. It has one fourth of the world reserves, and one-third of the transactions worldwide. So let's behave accordingly instead of making us small when we are big. I would wish that we come become a real player. And that is the reason also why the Commission thinks the same. Not because I wish. The Commission thinks the same, and we have made trade agreements with ASEAN, with Canada, with Singapore, with Colombia, with Mexico, Peru, South Korea, Japan. Japan, the latest one, um, is the largest bilateral agreement worldwide, 640 uh, million consumers amongst the richest in the world. So this is a question of credibility. This is a question of making a ring of friends. This is a question of soft power in geopolitics. And we are a, world, a rule maker in this because in all these agreements we make, we put in European standard, anti-dumping rules, our new trade defense um, instruments, social and environmental standards, sine qua non, GDPR, if you do not apply the GDPR rules, basically no trade agreements. Independent trade courts, which we created with Canada, if uh, Trump really uh, manages to destroy the WTO uh, trade um, uh, courts. And uh, just to quote our input on food safety, geographical uh, indications, precautionary principle, um, no hormones, no chlorification, and don't forget, in 10 years, 90% of the world growth will be outside the European Union. If you know that, well, then you prepare today, and you don't wait 10 years before you don't have any power anymore. And that brings me to Brexit. Well, you have understood on trade actions, okay. Data-driven society, we go to the right direction. You know that um, Madame von der Leyen has made uh, the Green Deal one of her major uh, elements in order to go ahead and uh, to, to try to solve the problems which are still possible uh, to be solved. On these questions, we have a choice. But what about Brexit? Doesn't it break up Europe? Well, it seems for the time being that it doesn't, but I tell you very frankly, nobody can be happy about that, eh? because a divorce is never a happy story. It's always a lose-lose situation. But this is a lose-lose situation which we could have seen coming. 
um, Great Britain in the European Union was uh, never felt at ease. It always tried to get exceptions on the budget, on the euro, on justice, on Schengen, you name it, you get it. It always was putting the foot on the brake. It stopped 12% of the proposals, even in, on the internal market, because it simply didn't want uh, Europe to, to go ahead. And then it had a very unwise uh, prime minister, David Cameron, whose first unwise move was to go out of the EPP, the European People's Party group, the biggest in the European uh, Parliament. You never leave the table of the deciding guys. I mean, to put yourself in a corner. How stupid you must be. Um, now, Luxembourgers have understood that since ever and ever. We are always sitting on the table. And we even don't go to the, war, to the, to the loo. You see, because we sit these days. In the meantime, they could do something. We, we sit there. It's only when you sit at the table that you have the power, even if you are small. Um, and then the referendum. Well, I have already told you the story about uh, Cambridge Analytica, which was leading the referendum. Referendum should have been le le leave it by the political parties. And there, I mean the conservative parties, I mean the socialist party, I mean the liberal parties, and not only uh, the uh, uh, illegally operating um, Brexit parties. So what is the situation now? Some figures. The EU trade with Great Britain is 9% of the total of the European trade. Great Britain's trade with Europe is 43% of exports and 50% of imports. I leave you reflect on these numbers. The Great Britain is part of all the trade agreements and treaties which the European Union has signed. 600, roughly, 600, out of which next year Great Britain will not be part anymore. So that goes from the uh, trade agreements I was speaking about uh, to open skies, uh, the uh, authorizations to utilize the sky um, place for, for the um, uh, for, for, for landing of the airplanes, the research, agriculture, Erasmus, blah, 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 blah. 600 agreements, Great Britain has to see that it makes new ones. Now, when you have heard the fact, facts and figures, I would very much like to see how you negotiate with somebody who considers you are small as compared to the European Union and with whom if you are somebody, you are going to make a favorable trade agreement. And to whom are you going to give some sweets? Another example. Do you know that in between Calais and Dover, there are per day 400 trains, 1 million parcels, 5,000 trucks, and 75,000 travelers per day, okay? You have to, they have to handle it, huh? They have to handle it. Now we have first the withdrawal agreement, which you know is uh, in force from today on. Um, that the negotiation started uh, in March 2017. The uh, agreement will apply as from the 31st of January this year and will continue until the end of this year. During this year, the UK will be part of everything, uh, of the single market, of the customs union, of Erasmus, of everything, but it will not be part in the decision making. Yeah. If I did something like this, I would never have been re-elected in Luxembourg. Uh, frankly, frankly, yeah? very frankly. So, during 11 months, it has to, and, and it pays, of course, 
uh, because the, 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 the agreements, uh, the, the budget agreements uh, uh, continue to, to go. Uh, in these 11 months, um, the Prime Minister of Great Britain has promised to conclude a new big deal. If it is a failure, then the transition period will end, definitely on uh, this year, and they will be a third country. Now, what is written in this agreement? This agreement has 600 pages, by the way. Yeah? Um, the European Parliament insisted that the first point must be the protection of the citizens. We speak about this 5 million, um, 3.5 million Europeans in the UK, and 1.5 million um, UK citizens in Europe, many here in Spain, as you know. Um, financing of the whole budget. The European Court is responsible for financial settlements. Uh, Ireland, in order to avoid a hard border and to uh, have uh, the collapse of the Good Friday Agreement, the border is not made between the two Ireland, but in the sea between Ireland and Great Britain. Customs and regulatory checks um, done there. Protocol on Gibraltar, you know, it's an administrative cooperation between UK and Spain. Uh, police and judicial cooperation continue but we don't know what will happen afterwards. And the breaches of EU law are in front of the European Court of Justice, and not only even if they go out next year completely, the procedures, um, the infringement procedures continue uh, even with a complete Brexit for the four years after the exit. So that is now the situation. What are the future relationships? We want it to be free and fair, as contained in the political declaration, 36 pages, and I quote Michel Barnier. The political declaration is easy to read, 36 pages, very concise, con covering all aspects of future relationships, where well, once we have agreed together, if we want to agree on each and every point of this political declaration, says Barnier, uh, it will take more than 11 months. So we are ready to do our best to the maximum to secure a basic agreement, but we will need more time to agree on the details. Um, what we cannot negotiate is the integrity of the single market. And you know in the single market there are the four freedoms. Free movement of capital, of goods, of uh, uh, services, and of people. They are indivisible. Huh? And the single market is much more than a free trading zone. It is an ecosystem with laws on common standard on the environment, rights for the workers and consumers, common supervision, and a common jurisdiction, the European Court of Justice. We will not touch on the integrity of the single market point. And then I just quote some questions which will be so easy to solve. Fishing rights. Well, I'm speaking here in Spain, okay? <laughs> so, couldn't, can you imagine that S Spain will sign any definite agreement if the fishing rights of the Spanish fishermen are not preserved? I can't. Financial services. Now, there is no negotiation possible on this because our treaties say very clearly that our equivalence rules only apply according to European law, so we can even not negotiate. We give them or we don't give them. No negotiation possible. So the greater the divergences will be, the more distance uh, post-Brexit um, relationship and uh, the larger the barriers. And there are no existing models there which can be copied. Uh, because for the same thing, uh, Norway, 
Norway accepts the single market and the four freedoms. The Ukraine accepts the court of justice. Turkey is in the customs union. Switzerland accepts the free movement and the regulation of, uh, of uh, the European Union. Canada, Jap Japan, uh, trade agreement. But wait a moment, Canada. Canada. You know how much many years it took us to negotiate and to put in place the bilateral agreement between the European Union and Canada? Ten years. Not ten months. Hmm? Um, the substantive provisions are 550 pages, the total text 2,000 pages, alone the text on the rules of origin of uh, our um, agricultural products are 100 pages. Now, good luck. Um, it is easier to tear down a wall rather than to build a new wall. And let me, before I close, read you a text. It has been written by the British government before the Brexit referendum. I quote, the UK is part of the EU, a group of 28 countries which exist to promote economic security, peace and stability. The, Europe, the EU operates as a single free trading market without taxes between borders. The UK has secured a special status in the EU. It has kept the pound, will not join the euro, has kept control over UK borders. We have ensured that no UK powers can be transferred to the EU in the future without a referendum. The UK will keep full access to the single market with a say on its rule. For every pound paid in tax, a little over one pence goes to the EU. The government judges that what the EU gets back in opportunity job creations and economic security from the EU membership far outweighs the cost, and it continues like this. Interesting to quote this text something, somewhere. So we have to do with divorce. It's going to be very negative, very difficult. I have just quoted you some of the difficulties, but we, we are lucky that um, we have Michel Barnier, um, at uh, the helm of doing this. Um, this man has made a sans faute, uh, really gorgeously clinging together the 27. The 27 were unanimous in order to go ahead for this. And I tell you, if we have an agreement, it will not be the 27 alone. It will be also 40, 40 national and regional parliaments which have to vote for such an agreement. And that's why I said I would like to see the, um, the Spanish parliament voting for losing all the fishery rights of the Spanish Armada. Eh? It will not happen. So there are 100,000 of fishery problems uh, at the equal level into this. And we need to have 40 parliaments who vote the final outcome. So it will not be going to be done in 11 months, I'm afraid. But very often in Europe we speak about decision making, input, what does the European Union do, or about policies, what does the European Union do for me, and uh, do we always speak about together we are stronger? Brussels is not a city. Brussels, it's us. It's all of us. And all of us have also to agree and to speak and to be in citizens' dialogues when we start now to discuss about the future of Europe. And we, you have to know, each of us, that each country, even the big ones, are too small to do it alone in a globalized world, where China is not going to go a step back, but it's going to go a step forward. Just look at the numbers of highly trained engineers they are producing every year. And compare that with our numbers of engineers, our, I mean, European numbers of engineers. It's very important. Let me quote Barack Obama when he was making his speech in Berlin. European unity was a dream of a few. 
it became a hope for many. Today, it is a necessity for all of us. Your accomplishment, more than 500 million people speaking 24 languages in 28 countries, 19 with a common currency in one European Union, remains one of the greatest political and economic achievements of modern times. I would hope Obama would still be there, but um, that's not the case. The answers we give today shape the world we have in our hands. And what will be the world which our kids will have in their hands? Very simple. By 2050, Europe will represent 7% of the world's population, down from 20% in 100 years before, 1950, 7%. By 2050, Europe will represent 15% of, of the world's GDP, down from 40% beginning of the 20th century. By 2050, Europe will be neither the largest economy nor the largest trading bloc in the world. By 2050, it will be too late. It's the responsibility of our generation to build a basis strong enough so that your generation can take over, decide by itself what is won in full sovereignty Europe is beautiful, let's keep it beautiful. Moltes gràcies al cor de la, de la Universitat Pompeu Fabra. Thank you very much. Now we have to proceed to the flag ceremony. So Mr. Taradella, who is the head of the European Commission representation in Barcelona, will hand out the European flag to Javier Arregui, and then I'll give him the chance to 
say a few words. Or do you want to speak before? Me. Go ahead. If you don't mind. Uh, when you make the laudatio of Mrs. Redding, uh, of course you could not mention everything, otherwise we will be still there, but there is one achievement of Mrs. Redding that I would like to mention particularly. That was on 11th December 1990, oh, when Mrs. Redding uh, approved as a president of the Committee of Petitions the famous Reading report that uh, created basically the representation of the European Commission in Barcelona because uh, the Parliament asked us to communicate with European citizens in Catalan. So, following your mandate, Mrs. Reading, Madaria Ufari Albates, Aquesta Bandera Europea, a nom de la Comissió Europea, perquè la tingueu un lloc visible i defenseu tot el que aquesta bandera significa de pau, d'unitat, de democràcia, de defensa dels valors fonamentals i de la diversitat en la unitat que representa Europa. Com a director, us vaig entregar oficial de la bandera. Moltes gràcies. Let me just say very, very briefly, there is absolutely nothing I could say to improve that ending. So I'm going to save my words for, for next occasion. Let me just briefly thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, joining us this morning for the opening ceremony of the Barcelona uh, Center for European Studies. Thanks once again, uh, Madame Redding, for a very inspiring uh, talk and thank you all. Now you're all invited to a glass of cava. I believe it's outside. So if you are free and want to join us, we'll be very thankful. Thank you very much again.